We begin, of course, with the latest on the Israel-Hamas war. Our team is monitoring the newest developments in the Middle East and here at home. We're going to start with NBC News correspondent Jay Gray, who is in Tel Aviv. Jay, good morning to you. So let's talk more about the hostages released by Hamas. What do we know about their identities? What are we hearing from their families? Yeah, both grandmothers. We know that their husbands are still in captivity. Their families are with them at this point. And one of the hostages speaking for the first time since her release, less than 24 hours after walking into the arms of Israeli soldiers and shaking the hand, by the way, of her captors as she left. What she has told us is that she was treated well, given food and water and medicine, allowed to stay clean, she said. Uh, she also said that she saw the network of tunnels in Gaza, that it looked like to her, quote, spider webs. And she questioned the IDF. She wanted to know why they did not take more seriously uh, warnings three weeks ahead of the attack. She uh, doesn't understand why there weren't uh, safeguards in place before the attacks, asking, frankly, the same question that many across Israel are asking right now about those attacks. Jay, Israel is now ramping up airstrike efforts, as we've been discussing. This is as more countries call, though, for a delay in any ground invasion of Gaza, including President Biden. More than 100 Palestinians were killed just yesterday in those bombings. What's the international response been like to that increase in attacks? Yes, yeah, Savannah, a lot of the international community is urging patience, is urging some resistance uh, for this ground assault that has been uh, on the edge for more than a week now. We know that over the last 24 hours, Israel has conducted what they call a wide-scale operation. They have not held back as far as the airstrikes are concerned, uh, hitting more than 400 targets, rocket and anti-tank installations, tunnels, command and operational centers. And the Israeli defense minister has said that they are in preparations for a multilateral operation with forces from the air, ground, and sea. So while there is this call from restraint that is growing, they continue to move toward what looks like some type of ground assault. Let's talk about America's role here. The secretary, the State Department confirms that Secretary Blinken yeah. is set to attend a U.N. Security Council meeting later today. And it's, of course, focused on the situation in the Mideast. It comes as the U.S. remains alert about potential attacks from Iran and neighboring countries. NSC coordinator John Kirby had this to say about U.S. presence in the Mideast. At the direction of President Biden, the Secretary of Defense has ordered the military to take steps to prepare for to ensure that we're postured appropriately, both in terms of being able to defend our forces and respond decisively as needed. The Secretary of Defense has directed two carrier strike groups to the region, and we are now sending more air defenses to U.S. air bases in the region. So what does all that mean for future U.S. involvement in this war, and what can we expect from today's meeting? Look, I, I think if you look at just the assets that have been moved to the region, you can see that there is a concern about this uh, becoming more widespread. We know that we have the two carrier groups, as you just heard, in all of the battleships that are part of those groups. You've got more than 100 jet fighters in the area as well, 2,000 Marines. Uh, you've also got the high-altitude THAAD and Patriot missile battalions here. And you've got 2,000 more forces that haven't moved in, but they have been put, put on standby, ready to deploy. That, along with the knowledge that special U.S. forces are in the area, uh, we're told they're here in an advisory role. So what do you expect from the meeting today? Restraint. You, you, you continue to hear this message of restraint in this area, but you don't see it on the ground to this point. All right. Jay Gray starting off our coverage from Tel Aviv this hour. Jay, thank you. NBC News terrorism contributor and analyst Jim Cavanaugh now joins us. He's also a retired ATF special agent in charge and former hostage negotiator for ATF. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. So freed, uh, four freed hostages so far, and Hamas has said it released the latest two women yesterday for what they were calling compelling humanitarian reasons. I want to play a little bit of one of the women who spoke at a hospital this morning said with her daughter translating. These are the conditions she described that her mom was held in. Let's listen. My mom is saying that they, they were very friendly towards them and that they took care of them, that they were given the medicine. My mom is very much hoping that all the people that were with her will come back and the story is not over till everybody comes back. 
She also, though, did describe it as going through hell. They described being beaten with sticks. Jim, uh, what do you make of the hostages release in terms of what it means here for the larger backdrop? Is this a sign that talks are moving in the right direction or is it too early to tell? Well, it's too early to tell. It's, it's a strategic move by Hamas. Uh, to gain an advantage uh, by letting two hostages out, you know, a couple of weeks ago, then two this week. What they hope to get from this is not, you know, oh, we're great uh, humanitarian people. They'd like the world to think that, oh, we have a, a good side. But what they're trying to do is buy some time. They have a lot of international hostages, and the, and the world is not happy about that. Hamas wants to pick their enemies, which are Israel, Israel and the United States. But they want to delay the ground attack. And they can do that by just releasing a couple of hostages. Now, they have 220 hostages, Savannah, so if they release two a week, that could take two years. They can play the long game there. So it's a strategic move by Hamas to, you know, let them save some face that, oh, yes, we're good people, we're humanitarians, we released them for humanitarian reasons. But in truth, they released them for their own reasons, which are probably to delay the ground assault and to get needed food and electricity and fuel in there. So they have ulterior motives. But from the standpoint of negotiators, that's okay as long as you can get the people out. <laughs> um, hoping to hold off on the ground invasion, hoping it creates more time for hostage talks, more time for aid to enter Gaza. So while we're waiting, what is going on behind the scenes as negotiations continue? Well, Qatar is playing a key role. I mean, they're playing the role as the, the broker between Israel and the U.S. And, and the world and Hamas, which is kind of a crazy scenario since Qatar also, you know, gives shelter to the Hamas leaders. The Hamas leaders live in Qatar, and yet they're being the broker. So it's kind of a phantasmagoria of Middle Eastern politics. But that's just the world we have to live in. And the negotiating team, Israeli, United States, uh, special operations negotiators, you know, FBI negotiators, uh, State Department diplomats. This is a deep negotiation that has to go slow. The thing is, sometimes when you get into these critical negotiations and things like this, you got to know when you're really winning. Uh, you know, Israel has uh, hit hundreds of Hamas sites. I mean, they've really degraded some of the, some of the Hamas leadership. Now, I don't know what the percentage of that is. Our intelligence uh, community knows, military knows, but they've killed a number of Hamas leaders in the last two weeks. They've hit a lot of their command and control bunkers. They've hurt Hamas in the last two weeks. They they had 400 strikes in the last 24 hours, so they're hurting them. And they got a few hostages out. So, you know, the thing is, be smart. Don't rush. You may be doing a little better than you think right now. Just just, just play it smart. <laughs> Jim, quickly, one complicating factor we also learned is that Hamas said it doesn't actually have custody of all the hostages. Some are being held <clears throat> by the Palestinian Excuse me, Islamic <laughs> Jihad. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and that's another militant group that's based in Gaza. So real quick, how does that affect yeah. negotiations? Well, that's true. And Palestinian Islamic Jihad may be, you know, not as under tight control by Hamas. They may be a little more independent uh, operators. And they could do some vulgar act to, you know, try to harm hostages on the video or kill them or make them human shields. If I was a family of one of the hostages, of course, it's a dire situation. Our heart goes out to them. But one thing I would hold on to is these hostages are very valuable to Hamas and Islamic Jihad. That's important to know because listen to the what the hostages who were released said. Yes, we were beaten some, but other than that, we were fed and kept, you know, okay. So uh, it, they're valuable to Hamas, to Hamas, not because Hamas is good guys, but because of their value in trade and getting something for Hamas. And I would hold on to that that thread if I was one of the families uh, involved here. All right, Jim Cavanaugh, thank you so much. One of those hostages, hostages believed to be held by Hamas is 23-year-old Hirsch Goldberg Poland. He has dual Israeli-American citizenship and was at that music festival when Hamas launched its surprise attack more than two weeks ago. Yesterday, his parents flew to New York to press the United Nations for help getting the hostages released. NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt has more on their story. Let me first, if I can, get your reaction to there have been another two hostages released. Of course, the Americans on Friday. Does that does that raise your level of hope? 
I would say on the one hand, we look for hope wherever we can grasp at it. So in some ways, a little bit. Bottom line is when all 200 plus are released, and for, in our case, obviously, we're most concerned about our own son who's wounded. Um, that's what we're hoping is going to happen. Hirsch, the 23-year-old, was last seen in this photo on the left, hiding from Hamas in a bomb shelter near the music festival. Witnesses say Hirsch's arm was blown off in an explosion. He then applied his own tourniquet before being driven off in a Hamas truck. He needs a certain kind of surgery, and he needs heavy doses of antibiotics. I don't know that he's getting either one of those two things. Hirsch is a dual U.S.-Israeli citizen. I first met his parents in Jerusalem, where they now live. They came to New York to plead for the United Nations' help in freeing the hostages. There are hostages from somewhere between 30 and 40 countries. They're elderly, they're babies, they're critically wounded. This is a global humanitarian issue that we want to raise at the United Nations and have leaders of the world join together and scream to solve this humanitarian crisis. I saw the, the almost the control room you've established in your living room there. Have you heard any more information that specifically gives you a timeline of, of where he might be or what the circumstances might be at this point? We really haven't. We really haven't. And remember, Lester, we don't know that he didn't die on that truck when he was abducted because there's been no proof of life for any of the hostages who are being held. So none of us know. So your, your most important role right now is to keep his name out there and keep this, this story out there. We have one mission, bring him home and get him the treatment that he needs. Immediately, like time is running out. And every single person should know that. We just keep hoping that somewhere, somehow, Hirsch knows that not only are his parents and his siblings fighting for him, but that there is a world of people out there who are pulling for him and pulling for all the hostages. And I hope that they sense that sense of good in the world. And our thanks to Lester Holt for that interview. Goldberg, Poland's friends and family have started a social media campaign using the hashtag Bring Hirsch Home. His parents say the messages of support are keeping them going during this difficult time. All right, NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now from Cairo with the latest on the humanitarian situation within Gaza. Hey, Megan, good morning. So despite the release of these two hostages, Israel has not slowed down its bombing campaign, as we've been discussing this morning and officials in Gaza say more than 5,000 Palestinians have now been killed, the majority of whom are women and children. Tell us right now about the situation inside Gaza, just how many people have also been displaced in addition to those deaths and injuries. Well, Savannah, good morning. The situation in Gaza gets more dire by the day. As you recall, uh, the Israelis told the Palestinians to evacuate to the southern part of the enclave. Uh, but we can see uh, over the last several uh, weeks now that there's no safe place in Gaza. Uh, the southern part of the enclave continues to be bombarded with bombs every day. Uh, overnight, according to the Palestinian health ministry, neighborhoods were bombed, homes were bombed, uh, where more than 120 people uh, lost their lives. Uh, now, as far as the displacement is concerned, the U.N. Humanitarian Aid Agency says more than half of the population has been displaced. So we're talking some 1.4 million people uh, that have lost their homes. Um, 600,000 are in emergency shelters, but of course that doesn't account for the entire population. So you imagine there are other people that are sleeping uh, on the streets or uh, on rubble. Uh, we just don't know. But it is a dire situation uh, that certainly doesn't seem to be improving. Megan, we saw a third convoy of aid enter Gaza yesterday. We know it's not enough to help everyone, but are these supplies getting to some of the people who need it most? And what more is being done to try and get more in? Yeah, so officials on the ground tell us that it is a slow moving process. As you mentioned, we started to see the convoy of trucks moving into uh, Gaza by way of the Rafah border crossing on Saturday. There was 20, uh, 20 shipment there. There were 15 uh, that went in on Sunday, 20 yesterday. And we know that there are more trucks that are uh, waiting to try and cross through the Rafah border crossing into Gaza today. Um, but as you mentioned, uh, you know, there isn't enough. Uh, officials on the ground are describing this as a drop in the bucket. 
UNICEF, for example, saying that of the water shipment that came in on Saturday, for example, uh, there was enough water for 20,000 people for one day. And we know that the need is far greater uh, with more than 2 million people uh, in desperate need. Uh, and then, of course, you have to consider the fact that there is not fuel on board those shipments. Uh, and there is a dire need inside Gaza for fuel. Uh, one hospital official saying that they are on the brink of running out. And, and what that looks like for them is that 55 babies could die in a matter of minutes uh, because the incubators would stop working because they don't have enough fuel to generate those generators. Um, this is a dire situation. Mm. We've, we've talked to other officials on the ground there who say that their hospitals have already gone dark. Um, and so the humanitarian aid organizations are concerned that there won't be enough fuel to be able to fuel the trucks that are then going to be distributing the aid. So there's continuous calls for fuel. But at this point, uh, the Israelis have not allowed that to be a part of the shipment. We had an opportunity to speak to um, a uh, director of the U.N. humanitarian aid organization on the ground. And I want you to listen to a little bit of what he had to say. Right now, we have three days stocks of fuel left in Gaza. We need fuel to come into Gaza, otherwise hospitals are going to close. The aid that's coming in right now is not of the scale that we need to serve the population. 34 trucks over two days is a drop in the ocean. This killing, the destruction has got to stop. Uh, people are scared for their lives in Gaza. The conflict needs to end. So, guys, the situation on the ground in Gaza that is just rapidly deteriorating. Mm. All right. Megan Fitzgerald, thank you so much. We're now joined by NBC News senior national security and intelligence analyst John Brennan. He's also the former director of the CIA. Good morning. Uh, thank you for so much for joining us. This upcoming weekend is going to mark three weeks since the attack on Israel. Just right now, what are some of the big challenges going forward when it comes to releasing more hostages and trying to handle this war diplomatically? Well, uh, Israel continues to ha take punishing strikes against uh, Hamas targets inside of Gaza. And I'm sure that is just increasing the animosity that a lot of Palestinians feel toward Israel, irrespective of the horrific attacks that Hamas carried out. And so what Hamas is trying to do is have this trickle out of some hostages as a way to increase pressure inside of Israel, domestic political pressure on Bibi Netanyahu, not to launch this ground invasion, but also to put pressure on external players, such as the United States, to see whether or not they can get Israel to at least continue this pause with the hope that some additional uh, hostages will be released. Uh, that's why the, the Qataris and the Egyptians that have the closest relations with Hamas uh, are the ones that are conducting some of these uh, back-channel negotiations with Hamas. Uh, I'm sure they're putting pressure on Hamas in order to release some of the additional hostages. But again, I do not think that Hamas is going to release uh, these hostages in mass at all, because mm. as uh, Jim Kavanaugh was saying earlier, they are valuable and Hamas will continue to try to leverage them in order to uh, prevent or at least um, delay this uh, ground offensive by Israel, which I think is probably inevitable, but it has been uh, put on pause. How much of a concern is there within U.S. national security and diplomatic circles that if and when that ground invasion does happen, this becomes a larger conflict very fast within the region? I think that's a very, very uh, serious concern on the part of the U.S. administration. It's, I think, one of the principal reasons why President Biden traveled to a war zone to try mm -hmm. to ensure that the Israelis and Bibi Netanyahu understood that there is the potential for this to escalate and to spiral out of control. Uh, Hezbollah has been exchanging rocket fire with the Israelis in northern Israel. Uh, but if this ground offensive is launched and there is going to be uh, more and more uh, death uh, to uh, the, the Gaza inhabitants, I think Hezbollah is going to face increased pressure to step up those attacks. And if Hezbollah gets involved in a major way and Israel retaliates, then that's going to bring Iran into the equation as well. So I think that's why they're trying to make sure that there's going to be a thoughtful deliberation on this ground offensive by the Israeli leaders. We only have a few seconds here, but you mentioned Qatar. What should we know about the role that Qatar is playing, especially when it comes to the hostage release? 
Well, the political office of Hamas is located in Doha, the capital of Qatar, and Ismail Haniya, who basically is the leader of, uh, of Hamas, uh, has been resident there for the past number of years. Sheikh Tamim, the emir of Qatar, uh, I think has uh, been uh, understanding exactly that uh, the Palestinians in Gaza need uh, financial and economic assistance. That's why Qatar has given hundreds of millions of dollars a year over the past number of years uh, with Israeli uh, approval and acquiescence. Uh, but I do think that uh, Sheikh Tamim and the Qataris are are trying their best to try to get as many of these hostages out uh, and, and in an effort to not only relieve the situation of the hostages, but also to prevent a wider conflict that I know that mm -hmm. the, the Guthries want to avoid as well. All right. Former CIA Director John Brennan, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, U.S. forces are planning to be postured appropriately in the Middle East. That's according to National Security Council Coordinator John Kirby. As NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby explains, the military is moving more resources into the region following an increasing number of attacks on U.S. forces in the area. With growing threats to the U.S. military in the Middle East, the Pentagon making significant moves, including reinforcing their air defenses, rerouting the USS Eisenhower carrier strike group to the waters off Iran, and telling more U.S. troops to be ready to deploy. After at least six attacks threatening U.S. troops in as many days in Iraq, Syria, and the Red Sea, the U.S. blaming Iran and their proxy groups. We know that Iran is closely monitoring these events and in some cases actively facilitating these attacks. U.S. officials say troops would not go to war in Gaza and the goal is to deter a larger regional conflict. NBC News recently had an exclusive look at that deterrence. This is the HMS Prince of Wales. It's England's newest and biggest warship. But right now, we're out here to see how the British Navy and the U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps are all working together. That includes U.S. Marine Corps Ospreys and F-35s that are practicing landing on the deck of this British carrier. U.S. sailors, U.S. Marines, Royal Navy sailors, Royal Marines have operated alongside each other for years. But right now, we're really focused on deterring any actor, whether it's Iran, whether it's one of the you know, non-state actors. Our thanks to Courtney Kibbe for that report. Well, the U.S. shot down two drones yesterday targeting American troops in southern Syria. There were no casualties. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.